While they get my presentation up there, I, my name is Jessica Gephardt, and I am a postdoctoral fellow from the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. This is a research center affiliated with the University of Maryland out in Annapolis, and the goal is really to, to use existing data to ask new questions about human environmental systems. Um, most of my work really focuses on global seafood trade with an interest in connecting consumers to the distant environmental impacts. That's really how I started getting involved in some of this work on thinking about the environmental impacts of seafood in the context of the whole food system. Um, this work that I'm going to be talking about today is going to preview some work that's a partnership with the Nature Conservancy, thinking about where you can invest in aquaculture in order to get simultaneous nutrition benefits, but also decrease some of the environmental impacts associated with diets. Um, you can see here a few different production systems, and as we've already covered in this session, aquaculture production is highly diverse. It can be inland, it can be coastal, it can be in the open ocean, it can be in pens or ponds or racetracks, and all of that diversity creates a huge diversity in the kinds of environmental impacts associated with production. Similarly, you're producing really different foods from oysters to shrimps to tilapia, and all of these have a different nutrition profile. So really what we're trying to do here is think about how you bring these two pieces together of nutrition and the environment to think about how we can improve uh, where we invest in our aquaculture to make it more nutrition sensitive. Now, what do we mean by nutrition sensitive aquaculture? This is really a term that we've uh, kind of made up and really stolen from the FAO's nutrition sensitive agriculture, but it's a movement to take a more food-based approach. So rather than just investing in producing calories or increasing yields, that you take a food-based approach looking at the nutrition and providing diverse foods in order to combat malnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies while simultaneously trying to support livelihoods. So the overall objective is really to make the global food system better equipped to produce positive nutrition outcomes. So that's really what we're trying to do in this project. And part of that is taking into account the current role of seafood and nutrition globally. This is a map of the percent of animal protein from seafood around the world. So this is just one indicator of the role of seafood and nutrition. And you can see in these darker red areas where people are getting more than 30% of their animal protein from seafood. These are really hot spots of dependency on nutrition in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and unsurprisingly a lot of Southeast Asia. At the sub-national level though, there's even greater um, diversity in how dependent people are on seafood for nutrition. So we're really interested in those areas where small increases in seafood can create large benefits from a nutritional standpoint. But of course, seafood provides much more than just protein. As the first session covered, the long chain omega-3 fatty acids are really important and essential for um, brain development. But then fish also supply vitamin D, iron, calcium, zinc, and other minerals, which can all be really crucial for development. As a result, the Food and Agricultural Organization has been talking about improving their seafood production and access as this nature's superfood in order to improve health. Um, here in the US though, our seafood consumption has been pointed out is a bit lower than what uh, many other places in the world are consuming and is well below what the USDA has recommended in terms of um, what folks should be having for a healthy diet. So we're hovering around 15 pounds per person per year um, and that's substantially lower than the recommendation around 26 pounds per year. And if we're going to close that gap, it's going to mean that we're going to have to um, increase our seafood supply. And that could be either through production here in the US, and as has already been pointed out, the opportunities to expand capture production are fairly limited. However, we don't produce a whole lot of aquaculture, and there's quite a bit of potential to expand our aquaculture production here in the US. The other option is coming through imports, and already we, we do import a substantial amount of seafood, a lot of that coming from aquaculture. So this poses, though, an important question of if we're going to increase our seafood production, how can we do that without increasing environmental impacts? So a lot of people have historically thought of some negative environmental impacts associated with aquaculture, including the conversion of mangroves, the release of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen into waters, leading to algal blooms or eutrophication, issues related to water scarcity in parts of Southeast Asia, as well as um, some other forms of pollution. 
But when we take this in the context of a diet, we have to consider that every food has associated environmental impacts. So we need to think what is the relevant comparison when talking about a sustainable diet and how we can improve nutrition within that. So we have to bring those two pieces together of nutrition and environmental impacts across different foods. Um, one way that people can do this in a systematic way is to use life cycle assessment. So this is a pretty simplified version of a supply chain where you have the production of seafood and its associated inputs like aqua feeds and then the trucking, processing, and distribution to consumers. Now along that supply chain, there are different kinds of inputs. And in life cycle assessment, some common inputs that are thought about are land, fertilizer, pesticides, and water. And this starts to create this, little, this web of um, associated impacts with the, that occur with those various inputs. So those can be biodiversity loss or eutrophication or water stress. Um, and so already this is quite a, a complicated picture for this fairly simple uh, looking supply chain. But uh, what this framework of life cycle analysis does is it provides us a way to use common standards and look at comparisons of environmental impacts along these chains and understand where some of the leverage points are for reducing the environmental impacts. One thing that we're seeing recently is um, more studies trying to do that comparison across foods. Now, there's quite a bit of data here, so I'll walk through this and try to point out a few key pieces. This is a paper published in Science by Por Nemechek um, this year. And one thing that's really important that it does is it took underlying data from 1,500 studies representing over 28,000 different farms and ran them through a common life cycle assessment model so that there were standardized assumptions. And what this does is it allows for an apples to apples comparison of these different foods. So you see here um, along the left panel, there are different foods one, for 100 grams of protein of each food with different kinds of impact categories like carbon emissions, land use, and water scarcity. One thing that's notable here is that um, we can, is that they did include a couple kinds of farmed seafood, crustaceans and fish. It's also notice, notable that uh, capture fisheries and um, bivalves or oysters are not included on here, um, which tend to have very low environmental impacts, the, the bivalves. Um, but you can look across these impact categories and see that uh, if you look at crustaceans, they're pretty similar to cheese when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. But, um, but the crustaceans use way less land. Um, similarly, you can say that for fish, it's relatively similar to poultry on the greenhouse emissions front, but much lower in terms of land use. And so this, is, this creates this idea that you have to take a multi-dimensional approach to thinking about the environmental impacts associated with food production. One other thing that's really notable here is that these bars are pretty wide. So there's quite a bit of variability in terms of the estimated uh, environmental impact associated with these production systems. And some of that has to do with the location of where it's produced, but a lot has to do with differences in production methods and the fact that these categories encompass a wide variety of products. So while um, beef gets to be broken down into two categories of dairy herd and, and the beef herd, seafood farm fish is covering a huge range of different kinds of fish produced in these very different production settings. Um, so unsurprisingly, there's, there's a good bit of heterogeneity in there. One other thing that's notable, though, is that this comparison was done on a per gram of, of protein basis. But is protein really the relevant baseline to do this comparison? There are all other kinds of nutrients that you could compare based on. So it could be done on calorie, per gram of product, per milligram of iron. And when you do that, it does shift things around. So this data is from the United States for production in the United States. Again, pretty broad categories um, with bars representing uh, the land, footprint, nitrogen footprint, carbon footprint, and water footprint for these different food groups. Um, and we won't get into the details of this figure, but just the bigger bars are bigger footprints, uh, which can sort of correlate there with the impact. But what happens is just when you do this on a per calorie basis and then switch to a per gram of protein basis, you see now the fruits and vegetables have much higher footprints. When you flip again to iron, you get really big footprints for milk and cheese or zinc. Things shift around again. And so the point here is really just that there's no single answer to what's the correct baseline. 
And we have to think a little, in a little bit more complex way about how we pull both of these together. Um, so one way that I've approached that in the past is to use an optimization approach where you're trying to minimize the environmental footprint. So you try to minimize the water footprint separately, minimize the carbon footprint separately, and see what does the diet look like when you're still meeting all of those re nutrient requirements. Um, this is not a dietary recommendation. Optimization gives you a very simple solution, but it's just about the patterns that occur across those different footprints, as well as which foods tend to pop up. And what we see here uh, in these results is that the diets tend to look pretty similar, which A, means that you tend to get a lot of co-benefits in terms of lower footprints with similar, pretty similar looking diets. If you allow people to eat all day, so 100 servings, they just sat around and ate vegetables and nuts, that will give you the absolute lowest footprint, but it's a pretty unreasonable approach um, to a diet. So if you put this constraint in in the number of servings, that little sliver there that pops up uh, in the green is actually seafood. And seafood's the only animal product that pops in, and it actually comprises a pretty substantial amount of the diet at those lower serving constraints which suggests that seafood is pretty efficient at providing all of these micronutrients while minimizing these various environmental footprints. Um, that's a really simplified approach, though, and of course doesn't take into account local context, preferences, um, or all of that variability in terms of production. And so to kind of build off some of this idea of how do we improve nutrition with lower environmental impacts, we have some upcoming work with the Nature Conservancy and collaborators at Harvard to pull these two pieces together. And the general approach that we're taking here is to drill into specific countries that are already producing some aquaculture, where seafood plays an important role in nutrition, and where the Nature Conservancy has, is already doing work and has some local connections. Um, we're then going to use a model to estimate the nutrient requirements and current shortages of the population based on the demographics, so the gender and age structure within each country, to understand what are the, the local needs uh, in terms of nutrients. The second piece is then to consider different kinds of possible aquaculture products and which of those are have a nutrition profile that best meets those needs for that particular context. We're then integrating the nutrition piece into a life cycle assessment to balance those nutrition benefits with the environmental impacts and think about these two pieces together in that more localized context. So this work is just starting. We just hired a postdoc on this project uh, this month. So uh, it's too early to talk much about what we're seeing there. But uh, we're really looking forward to some of those results. And this is, again, I'm working with Robert Jones from the Nature Conservancy and then Chris Golden and Gideon Eschel from Harvard University, as well as Alan Chapon from the Weissman Institute. Thank you. Thank you.